Good evening, everybody, and welcome. Welcome to this week's Freeland Biomedical Research Institute, Maury Strauss Distinguished Public Lecture Program. I want to take this opportunity to thank Maury for his incredible support of this program for the entire community. We certainly greatly appreciate that. Uh, before I introduce this evening's speaker, I would like to uh, put in a plug for the following speaker in the program. And the next speaker in the Distinguished Public Lecture Series will be in April, on April 14th which will be Dr. Deborah Tucci, Director of the National Institute of Deafness and Other Communication Disorders at NIH. And Dr. Tucci will speak on living your best life, how hearing well contributes to healthy living and healthy aging. So I hope to see many of you there at the next uh, lecture as well. So without any more delay, it's my great pleasure to introduce this evening's uh, speaker, Dr. Carol Greider. Dr. Greider is the Distinguished Professor of Molecular, Cellular, and Developmental Biology at the University of California, Santa Cruz. She did her undergraduate work in biology at uh, UC Santa Barbara, and then her PhD in molecular biology at UC Berkeley with Liz Blackburn. Uh, she then was a fellow and an investigator at the Cold Spring Harbor Labs in New York, and then joined the faculty at Johns Hopkins, where she became the Daniel Nathans Professor, and then later the Bloomberg Distinguished Professor uh, and also uh, led the Department of Molecular Biology and Genetics. And by the way, she remains a university professor at Johns Hopkins as well. Um, Dr. Greta recently moved from Hopkins to UC Santa Cruz, and she gave up her administrative responsibilities there to take on some more teaching along with continuing, of course, her research. She's highly recognized for her major contributions to understanding the cell biology of chromosomal structure and function and development in health and disease. She's received multiple highly important awards recognizing her contributions to both biology and medicine, including the Sharing Plow Scientific Achievement Award, the Rosenstiel Award in Basic Medical Science, the Gruber Cancer Research Award, the Lasker Award for Basic Medical Research. And then in 2009, she shared the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine with Liz Blackburn and with Jack Shostak as well. She's an elected member of the National Academy of Science, National Academy of Medicine, a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. She also serves on the NIH Directors Group on Changing Culture to End Sexual Harassment. Uh, while in Liz Blackburn's lab as a graduate student at Berkeley, Dr. Greider was first author on a series of truly seminal papers on the use of the protozoan tetrahymena, discovering in that the telomere terminal transferase activity, a ribonuclear uh, protein DNA polymerase. Uh, she showed that RNA co purified with the enzyme activity. She cloned the RNA component that provides information for the telomere repeats. And she also went on to show telomere function is conserved across species. She's made a number of discoveries showing shortening in tumor cells and how human, human tumor cells turn on telomerase to allow continued growth and how it's activated in later stages of tumor progression. Uh, along the way, uh, she and her colleagues cloned the gene for the mouse telomerase, made knockout animals. Those mice were viable, showed progressive telomere shortening over multiple generations of breeding, but then recapitulated age-related degenerative diseases, some of those seen in, in families with inherited telomere syndrome. She's also found that telomerase mutations in families with other disorders, such as, for example, pulmonary fibrosis. I think uh, Dr. Greider's work is truly uh, a beautiful, maybe the most beautiful example of basic science uncovering some of the most fundamental molecular processes of life and also translating that knowledge to understand that informed scientific thought and action for better health. And for those of our uh, graduate students that are on the program tonight who <clears throat> know have taken a course called Methods and Logic where we go over papers and the logic behind them, I can't think of a more beautiful set of examples of methods and logic and the progression of the work of Dr. Greider. So without further delay, please join me in welcoming Dr. Greider. Thank you for that um, very nice introduction. Let me see if I can get started here with, uh, whoops. Sorry about that. Something, something happened. Can you see that uh, slide yep. now? Yeah, that's great. Thanks a lot. Sorry, sorry about that. 
Um, well, it's a great pleasure uh, to be here. Wish I could be here with you um, in person, but it's nice to be able to virtually uh, visit uh, Virginia Tech and um, learn all about the uh, things that are going on here. Um, what I'm gonna do today is um, take you through um, a little bit of the, the history of um, why we got interested in telomeres and telomerase and try and make that link about um, how a fundamental discovery uh, can actually lead to um, important uh, uh, disease uh, issues. So what we're gonna be talking about today are chromosomes and the chromosomes are made of DNA. So your body is made up of a large number of cells and within the cell, there's a nucleus that houses um, each of the chromosomes. So you can see each of the chromosomes here within this nucleus. Uh, the chromosomes has very characteristic butterfly uh, kind of a shape. Um, and if you look uh, very closely within this, the chromosome is made up of DNA and that DNA has specific um, bases that encode everything in the genome. So there's A, T, G, and C, and this code makes up the blueprint for everything that your cell has to do. What we're gonna be focusing on today um, is not the DNA in the middle of the chromosome, but rather what's happening at the very end of the chromosome, uh, which we call the telomere. So here's another view um, of the nucleus with all the chromosomes within the nucleus. And if you pull out one of those chromosomes, um, along the length of the chromosome is all of the genes and the regulatory elements and everything that specify what that cell has to do. What we're gonna focus on here is the telomere, which is the end part of the, of the chromosome. And the telomere plays a very important function uh, for two specific roles. The telomere has to protect the end of the chromosome, protect it from any kind of nucleases that might chew away at the end or from two chromosomes fusing together. And the telomere also has to allow for length maintenance. And I'll be getting into what I mean by this um, a little bit more um, in just a few minutes. Telomeres were first defined in the 1940s. Barbara McClintock was working in the plant, maize or corn, trying to understand um, how chromosomes were stable. Um, and so she, she defined that there must be this functional element at the very end that protects the ends of the chromosome. Excuse me, Carol. Carol, I'm sorry yeah. to break in. Uh, your slides are not advancing. We're still stuck on the first slide. Okay. Okay. How are they advancing? There, there you go, yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for telling me that. So we were talking about um, within the cell, there's a nucleus, Within the nuclei, there are chromosomes and the DNA that makes up the chromosome is encoded uh, by these bases, A, T, G, and C. And what we're focusing on here is the very end of the chromosome or this telomere, which provides a cap at the end of the chromosome um, that provides these two functions to protect the chromosome ends and to maintain telomere length. And so this is where we got to um, that uh, Barbara McClintock first was the one that um, defined that there must be this protective function at the ends of chromosomes when she was studying uh, the chromosome uh, structure um, in corn plants. The actual DNA sequence of telomeres, the telomere sequence was identified by Liz Blackburn. And what she found was that there are simple repeats. These are tandem repeated sequences T, T, followed by four Gs, T2, G4, T2, G4. Many, 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 many repeats of this. Unlike the rest of the chromosome, this does not encode for genes. Um, instead, it provides this um, protective function at the end of the chromosome. So while most of the chromosome is coding, this is, provides a different function. And um, Liz found this uh, telomeric DNA sequence studying this single cell pond animal, which is pictured here, has the name Tetrahymena thermophila, single cell pond animal. And the reason that 
um, she wanted to study this, is that a single cell has 40,000 chromosomes, unlike the um, uh, 32 chromosomes that um, humans have. So if you wanna go to the source, if you're interested in a particular biological function, you go to the source. Um, and so uh, that's where the telomeres were first defined. While studying uh, telomeres, it became apparent that there was a problem with what happens to the ends of chromosomes when cells divide. So if we have along the length here, most of the chromosome, and so this is not shown to scale, and then we have these telomere repeats, these repeated DNA sequences, which cap the ends of the chromosomes. We know by the way that um, chromosomes are copied, the, uh, the actual um, mechanism by which these chromosomes are copied, that there's a little bit of a loss of the sequences at the very end of the chromosome every time there's a cell division and you have to make another copy of the chromosome, a cell division make another copy of the chromosome. Um, and this is just inherent in the way that the enzymes that copy the chromosomes function. So it's predicted that there are these um, progressive telomere shortening um, that would occur. But if you actually look in tetrahymena, we found that in fact, there wasn't progressive telomere shortening. So that's where uh, Liz and I then set out to understand how is it that the telomeres can actually be maintained um, with many rounds of cell division. And just to summarize, what we found is that although telomeres do shorten during cell division, these short telomeres can then be elongated by having these sequence repeats added on to the end. And this is a little cartoon of um, uh, this favorite enzyme that we call telomerase, because telomerase adds repeats back onto the ends of the chromosome. So as a consequence, there's some shortening that happens every, um, with every cell division, and then there's some lengthening and shortening and lengthening. And the important key that I'll be talking to you about today is that this means that there's um, an equilibrium of length that this telomerase has to maintain. Although we like to um, draw this nice cartoon about telomerase, um, we actually know a lot more about the structure of the enzyme. And we know that telomerase contains an essential RNA component and a catalytic protein component. So this is just a cartoon of the telomerase enzyme. This dark gray line here shows the structure of the RNA component of telomerase. And this uh, light gray oval here shows the catalytic a protein component of telomerase. And within this RNA, there is a template region so that those uh, telomeric repeats uh, can be added onto the ends of the chromosome. So telomere length is maintained about an equilibrium. And this is the, the key uh, question that we're gonna be um, having to um, understand um, about how telomeres are maintained. What's uh, indicated here is a cell with a whole bunch of chromosomes. And each one of the chromosomes has a slightly different number of these telomeric repeats. These blue um, ovals here are meant to represent the telomeric repeats. So because of its history of shortening and lengthening, every chromosome end is gonna have a slightly different length. If you can take and just cut right at the base of where the telomere is and look at the distribution of the length of these uh, chromosomes, what you find is that there's a very nice, well-maintained equilibrium. So uh, with length um, on this x-axis here, you can see that there are a few telomeres that are very short. There are a lot of telomeres that are medium length, and there are a few telomeres that are very long. Um, so that's what we observe when we um, measure uh, this telomere length. And this uh, telomere length equilibrium um, is what's gonna become uh, very important in terms of understanding human disease. So why does telomerase matter? What we've learned over a number of years is that it's required for all cells that must divide many times. So there's two areas of human disease where this has an impact. First, in normal tissue renewal. 
So your, your skin cells, when they have to renew, when you have a cut, your blood cells that renew every day, there are certain cells that have to be able to maintain um, a tissue. And these cells called stem cells often make a copy of themselves, but then also give rise to daughter cells that are different. And so uh, more daughter cells that are different, et cetera. And in order for this to continue, the telomeres have to be able to be maintained. The other area that telomerase plays a major role is in cancer. Again, we have um, a tissue specific stem cell. So this cell can make a copy of itself so there are more stem cells. And then they, they divide and they differentiate into different cell types. If there's a mutation that occurs that causes this cell to now become a cancer cell, that cell can't go on and divide and actually form all of these tumor cells unless it solves the telomere problem. Because recall, every time a cell divides, the telomeres get shortened and they have to be re-lengthened by telomerase to maintain this equilibrium. So this is uh, two important um, areas of human disease where uh, telomerase plays a critical role. So in order to understand um, what happens when um, telomeres get to be short, um, we used mice. So mice can help us understand what happens to telomere function. We asked a very um, fundamental question, what happens if telomeres can't be elongated? So we generated a mouse and we tested this mouse that lacks the telomerase enzyme. So now uh, that re-lengthening can't occur um, when the cells um, are dividing. And what we found is that progressive telomere shortening occurs in mice that lack telomerase. So what's indicated here um, is two mice that we cross together and we call these the G1 for the first generation, the first generation of mice that don't have any telomerase. These first generation mice didn't have any problems. They looked like normal mice, they behaved like normal mice. Um, they were, um, there was no issue uh, with their health. So when you cross these two mice, you get the second generation telomerase knockout mice. And these mice had slightly shorter telomeres than the original mice. When we take these G2 mice and cross two generation two mice to each other, we can generate the third generation telomerase knockout mice that now these mice have shorter telomeres than their G2 parents did. We can then take the G3 mice, cross them to each other, and generate the fourth generation knockout mice, which again had shorter telomeres than the parent. And what we found is that in these early generations, G1, G2, G3, there was no effect of the absence of telomerase, but we could see that the telomeres were shortening. In the very late generations, when the telomeres got to be very short, then we found that there were uh, dramatic um, effects on the health of these mice. We found that the short telomeres cause this loss of tissue renewal capacity. So in the blood, we found that there was bone marrow failure. In the intestine, there was loss of the cell lining. In the skin, there was decreased wound healing. In the hair, premature graying. And in the testes, there was cell death, which resulted in infertility. And again, all of these effects were only found in the late generation mice. They weren't present when, uh, in the early generation mice with the longer telomeres. So why is it that these short telomeres would cause all of these effects on multiple different um, organs in the mice? What we learned is that with cell division, these telomeres are shortening and they continue to shorten and continue to shorten because telomerase is not present. And when they get to be very short, they no longer protect the chromosome end. And this causes um, something called a DNA damage response. It looks like damage to the genome. And so what the cell does is it either stops dividing permanently, which we call cell senescence, or it undergoes a programmed cell death. But in any event, the consequence is that cells with these short telomeres won't divide any longer. And that's what underlies all of those different 
um, uh, tissue dysfunctions that we found in a late generation mice. The reason that we didn't see these in the first generation mice is that the telomeres in these first generation mice were still pretty long. The telomeres in the second generation mice are still pretty long. It isn't until the telomeres get to be significantly short that there's an effect that causes the cells to undergo either cell death or cellular senescence. So this is why um, I'm discussing the telomere length and the importance of the equilibrium point. So we can measure telomere length in the early generation uh, G1 mice. And we can see that the telomeres are um, around this nice distribution of this telomere length. And then when we look in the late generation uh, mice, we find that there's still a distribution, but it is shifted to the left. And so you have these short telomeres in these G6 mice that weren't there in the G1 mice. So we know that there's a threshold. At a certain threshold now, these short telomeres are signaling, signaling cellular senescence or cell death <clears throat> so that the um, telomeres, so that the um, tissue cannot uh, continue to renew. So we um, understood that telomerase is required for cells that have to divide many times. This normal tissue renewal um, was what we were studying in the telomerase knockout mouse, but we were also curious about the role of uh, telomerase in cancer. Um, it had been known for um, a number of years that uh, telomerase is upregulated in cancer cells. So we know that um, telomerase is not active um, in most human cells. It is active in some stem cells to allow for self renewal. But 90% of human cancers have activated telomerase. Other cancers, the other 10%, used an alternative method to elongate telomeres, which I could talk to people about offline if you're interested. But the conclusion is that maintaining telomeres is essential to all cancer cell growth. So we thought that we would um, test this a little bit more um, carefully, again, using the telomerase knockout mouse. So what we did was to take um, a known uh, model of uh, tumors in mice, and this is a tumor-prone mouse that gets a B-cell lymphoma. And we cross this mouse to the telomerase-deficient mouse um, that lacks the telomerase um, enzyme. And when we do this cross, of course, in all mice, we breed those to each other to get the G2, breed those to each other to get the G3, except G4, G5, and G6. And then we asked about the uh, tumor formation um, in these G6 mice compared to the G1 mice. What's shown here is a, a Kaplan-Meier survival curve. A, a little bit of, of actual data here, but let me just walk you through it. What's shown here is the percent of mice that are alive. And here are the days um, across the, uh, the bottom. So you can see at the start of the experiment, all of the mice um, are alive. And if you follow the black line here, these are the tumor prone mice that, are, that still have telomerase. They were the original tumor prone mice that we were looking at. And what you find if you follow this black line is that with increasing number of days, there are fewer mice that are alive. So by the time you hit 100 days, half of the mice have died from their B cell lymphoma. <coughs> If you now look at these tumor prone mice, but they are the first generation that lack telomerase, so these have no telomerase, but they still have long telomeres. You find that this blue line is very similar to the black line. So the, T cell, uh, the B cell lymphoma by the time you hit about 100 days, and then the mice continue um, to uh, decline. If, however, we look at the sixth generation, so these are now mice that have very short telomeres because we've been breeding them for successive generations. What you find is that about 75% of the mice 
are still alive at the very end of the experiment. So this was a dramatic um, rescue from uh, their tumor state. And uh, David Feldzer, who did these experiments, these little marks here, he would go and he would look at uh, certain mice um, during uh, the time course of this experiment. And what he found was the tumors had started in the mice. You would have these little micro lymphomas, but the tumors couldn't grow to be so big uh, that they would kill the mice. So um, the absence of telomerase doesn't stop the initiation of the tumor, but it stops its continued growth. So it's the short telomeres that can block the tumor growth. These mice here didn't have telomerase, but they had big, very long telomeres. When you have the short telomeres, now um, that's what's uh, blocking uh, the tumor growth. So this is just a, a diagram. We have a normal cell um, that's uh, dividing, and it then progresses to become a pre-tumor cell, and that would still occur. But if you have these short telomeres with the DNA damage, that then stops the ability of this to grow into a full-blown um, lymphoma. So having um, spent some time trying to understand the role of telomeres in cancer, we then had our attention uh, turned back uh, to the role of uh, telomerase in uh, normal tissue renewal um, because it was apparent that there were human genetic conditions uh, that uh, were mutations in the telomerase component um, that very closely mimicked what we had already found in our telomerase knockout mice. So this is a case of um, oftentimes people will understand a human genetic disease and then make a mouse model to test what's happening in that disease. In this case, we had been studying the mouse model just to understand the fundamentals of what happens with telomeres. And then subsequently it was discovered that there was a human genetic disease um, that was very similar to what we had found in our telomeres knockout mice. So a number of years ago, uh, we had um, shown uh, together um, with our collaborators, the telomere shortening occurs in normal human cells. So if you take uh, humans of different ages, shown across here, and you measure their mean telomere length, that's the median of the, the distribution of that um, telomere length equilibrium, you find that over time, there's shortening of the telomeres with age. Um, and we were very curious about um, why these telomeres would be uh, shortening with age. We know now that these cells uh, do have some telomerase, but telomerase is limiting. You have just enough telomerase normally um, for the, a certain amount of cell division. And these cells are dividing more times than telomerase can keep up with. And so you get this progressive shortening of telomeres with age. And then in uh, 2001, there was this uh, paper that was published um, in the journal Nature uh, by a collaboration with Monica Bessler, Phil Mason, and Indrajit Dokal. And the paper was entitled, The RNA Component of Telomerase is Mutated in Autosomal Dominant Dyskeratosis Congenita. I know this is a, a mouthful here, um, but the, um, uh, the things that these patients suffer from the most is bone marrow failure. So what they found was that telomerase deficiency causes bone marrow failure. Um, and we were very interested in um, how this uh, disease uh, might progress. Um, and so Mary Armanios, who at the time was a clinical fellow in my lab, um, started following up um, on some patients that came into the Johns Hopkins um, Hospital. So we found that by probing telomere biology, we could understand human disease. So this is a pedigree. Um, some of you are familiar with uh, pedigrees in human families. The patient that came uh, to the attention of the clinicians um, was this uh, patient uh, down here who had a bone marrow failure syndrome. Um, and he's uh, colored in black because he had a mutation in telomerase. Um, his father here um, uh, had a disease in his 50s and his grandmother um, had disease in her 60s. 
all of the individuals um, in this family, so these are um, all of the siblings here, those that um, are colored black had this mutation in telomerase. And one of the things that was very striking was that there was this um, earlier onset of disease in the grandchildren compared to the grandparents. And this should remind you of the telomerase knockout mouse. In the telomerase knockout mouse, as the telomeres are shortening, when the telomeres get to be very short, then you see the severe disease. And the same thing was happening with this, um, what's called genetic anticipation in these families, that there's an earlier onset of disease in these later generations. And so by having already studied the telomerase knockout mouse, it made this pattern um, appear uh, very apparent. So by studying has a registry of well over 100 families uh, with uh, mutations in telomerase or um, other telomere related genes, uh, what Mary has been able to find um, is that um, these inherited mutations cause uh, what we call the telomere syndrome that mimic age-related degenerative disease. So there's bone marrow failure, which we um, initially found and that the um, DOCAL group also found in uh, individuals. But in addition to that, in, within these families, um, in fact, the uh, most common um, cause, uh, uh, the most common um, effect of a telomerase mutation is pulmonary fibrosis, uh, which is a um, lung disease that typically comes on um, in the um, 70s or, or 80s, an age-related degenerative disease. Immunosenescence, uh, so the failure of uh, the immune system. Susceptibility to emphysema is present in these families. Chemotherapy intolerance. Liver cirrhosis. And gastrointestinal disease. And a number of these um, diseases that you see in these families um, were actually first seen um, in our telomerase knockout mouse. So now it's more important to really study what's happening um, in the humans to get a um, very clear um, understanding um, of this disease. And as I mentioned, um, there's this uh, progressive effect with an earlier onset in later diseases um, that tracks with the length of the telomeres. So in order to understand uh, this human genetic disease, we have to have a way of measuring who has the short telomeres in order to um, determine um, the diseases that are associated uh, with short telomeres. And so I've shown you um, a paper that we did um, a number of years ago. Uh, more recently, we have a new method for measuring telomere length. And if we repeat that and look at um, white blood cells um, of people of different ages, and the telomere length is shown here on the y-axis. All of these are cord blood. And so you can see within the nation, um, there is a distribution of normal telomere length. These are all individuals without disease. This is just to get an idea of um, if you draw a line uh, through here, this is the 50th percentile. Um, the normal distribution of telomere length falls around that uh, percentile. So you can also um, put uh, confidence intervals on this kind of data. It's kind of like plotting height and growth charts um, of, of children. There's uh, a distribution of what is, what is normal. So you can look at the 99th percentile for having uh, very long telomeres. You can look at the first percentile for having very short telomeres. Um, and when we do that and plot it on this uh, so-called telogram, we find that people with defects in telomere genes have shorter telomeres, and they are the ones that are at risk for disease. So what's shown here um, in these lines, uh, the red, green, and blue lines, um, are the data from the previous slide with a normal distribution. So it's just showing you where this normal distribution is. And if you look in families um, at the um, individuals that do not have mutations in telomerase, you can see in black here that they are falling in a distribution around the 50th percentile. If you now look at those individuals that have mutations in telomerase, you can see that they fall below the first percentile and between the first uh, and the 10th percentile in the normal distribution. So we can now identify 
individuals with short telomeres um, so that they could be uh, stratified uh, for treatment. So what I've been um, telling you about is this importance of this distribution of telomere lengths. So we have this equilibrium length where you have a few short telomeres, a lot of medium length telomeres, and a few long telomeres. And we know now that there are consequences for telomeres that are either too short or too long. The short telomere threshold, um, which is shown here, if telomeres go below that threshold, then there can be stem cell failure and you get these age-related degenerative diseases. In contrast, there's a long telomere threshold. If telomeres are either continuously maintained or they are um, initially too long, there's a predisposition to cancer. So that is why we think it's critically important to understand how this equilibrium is maintained. We know that telomerase has to be there to elongate the telomeres, shown here in this green line, and that cell division shortens the telomeres. But one question that we have is, how come telomerase won't just get onto a telomere and keep making it long for a long, long, long time? What is it that governs this exquisite distribution? So this is what we're um, actively uh, working on now and many others are um, in my lab here at UC Santa Cruz. How is a telomere length equilibrium established? What is a molecular mechanism? If this is a diagram of the telomeric DNA, we know that there's a little bit of an extension on one of the strands of the DNA compared to the other at the telomere. And we know that telomerase has to get onto the telomere and elongate it. But the question is, how much does it add when it gets on? And how frequently does it add it? Um, and that's what we'll be able to get at um, by understanding how telomerase is regulated at individual chromosome ends. So my take home message number one, here is a picture of um, the tetrahymena where both telomeres and telomerase uh, were first discovered, is that curiosity-driven research provides unexpected discoveries that get insight into biology and specifically disease. We didn't set out to understand what's happening in pulmonary fibrosis, but by following our curiosity about what happens to the telomere, we came across uh, the mechanism by which pulmonary fibrosis and bone marrow failure, failure um, cause disease. Okay, so anytime you see a slide that says telomere take home message, take home message number one, you know that there must be another take home message following. So I just wanna um, uh, take a little bit of a pause here and talk a little bit more about what uh, many of you may have been um, hearing about telomeres and aging. So I've been talking to you about um, age-related degenerative disease, pulmonary fibrosis, bone marrow failure, emphysema, um, and these are age-related um, diseases. If you look in the popular literature, you'll see a lot of other things about telomere. There are many hundreds of articles out there about telomeres and aging. And I just wanna um, talk a little bit about how this is a very complicated story. So if you go to the internet, you can find many um, examples. Uh, here's one that says, the secret to gracefully aging, treat your telomeres with love. Well, maybe this should have been on February 14th and then this could be a, um, a reasonable uh, Valentine's thing. I'm not sure how to treat my telomeres with love. Um, some other things that you can uh, read um, in magazines and on the internet. Um, here's an image of a person. I'm not sure what she's covered in here, but it says uh, researchers may have finally cracked the code to aging. The length and health of our telomeres, which are tiny but extraordinarily important pieces of genetic code stored deep within our cells. So there's um, a lot of things uh, that will suggest to you out there uh, that telomeres change lifespan, and we don't have any evidence the telomeres change lifespan, but um, that doesn't stop um, a number of companies from um, trying to sell you products 
uh, that will let you stay younger longer. So there are now many companies out there um, which will um, allow what they call direct to consumer telomere length testing. So here's one, life length, the world leader in telomere testing, another DIY telomere length testing kit, more telomere length testing. Um, and they uh, propose uh, that by telling you your telomere length, they can tell you something about how long you're going to live. However, there's a misunderstanding here um, with a lot of these uh, telomere testing companies. So I just wanna point out that as good scientists, we should be skeptical. In this case, what they're saying is that deviation from the 50th percentile of normal in the population, it does not mean that you're, so again, we show this distribution of telomere lengths. These are um, normal people without any disease. And what the telomere testing labs um, are doing is they're taking, for instance, somebody here um, at age 40 that has this uh, 6 kb telomere length and saying, okay, here's this telomere length. And then they extrapolate out here and say that actually that person um, has a biological age of a 60 year old. But that is an incorrect interpretation of this data because this is a distribution of normal in the population. All of these individuals are normal. Likewise, they would say that somebody here age 50 that has telomeres this long has uh, the biological age of a 30 year old. And again, that is incorrect. That's not how this data um, uh, should be interpreted. This has important com com uh, consequences uh, for uh, people's health, given that uh, short telomeres do cause a, um, a disease, but none of these individuals have telomeres that are that short. So the point here is that telomeres provide a buffer zone and there's no consequence until the buffer is lost. So here we show a chromosome end and all of the telomere repeats. This telomere has uh, 10 units of telomere repeat. With increasing numbers of divisions, that is shortening, but there's no biological consequence to a telomere that is this short. This telomere is perfectly functional. This telomere is perfectly functional. This telomere is perfectly functional. As these telomeres get shorter, it's only those individuals that have the significantly shortest telomere will you see an effect. So to suggest that there's a somewhat different biology of somebody that has telomeres this length or telomeres this length, um, there's no biological um, basis for that conclusion. The other thing you should be skeptical about is nutraceuticals. There are a lot of things you can buy out there which will suggest that they will um, increase your telomere length. Um, cracking aging, um, Telomax does more than help your long telomeres, um, some telomere cell cream, anti-aging formula of telomeres, uh, cellular longevity formula. The problem with these things is first of all, it's unclear that they do anything, but the other thing is that we know that long telomeres actually play a role in, um, in cancer. And so you have to be very, um, careful when you think about whether you wanna lengthen telomeres or shorten telomeres, you have to know exactly uh, what your initial telomere length is um, or um, there will be uh, significant consequences. So my take home message number two is don't believe everything you read. There's a lot of stuff out there um, which isn't, um, isn't very helpful. So I'll just um, end here and um, in summary, tell you um, a little bit about um, the important concepts that I was trying to get across today. Telomeres are required for chromosome protection. Telomerase is essential for telomere maintenance. Telomere shortening leads to cell death after many cell divisions. Short telomeres limit the growth of cancer cells. Short telomeres limit tissue renewal and contribute to age-related degenerative disease. So it's a very nuanced view of telomere length and the telomere length equilibrium. And finally, be aware of simple cures for aging. Be skeptical.
So I'll just um, end and uh, thank all of the lab members that um, have uh, contributed to all of this um, over some time. Here's my lab when we went to the March for Science um, in Washington in 2017. And um, we uh, now have a East Coast lab. I still have three students uh, left at uh, John Hopkins University um, that are just finishing up their PhDs. And we recently moved here to uh, UCSC. Um, and we are continuing our to the research, research here. And if there's anyone out there, um, I am actively recruiting postdocs here at UCSC. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Greider, fascinating. Um, so we have some questions in the Q&A. If anybody else has a question, just go ahead and put it in the q and I'm gonna start if I might and take the liberty of asking the first question. I, I was just wondering, within a given cell, in, in any tissue for that matter, uh, what sort of level of heterogeneity or homogeneity for that matter in terms of telomere length between different chromosomes is there? And is there any reason to suspect that certain chromosomes are particularly sensitive or less sensitive to uh, more rapid uh, shortening over generations of their telomeres? Well, you must have been reading the literature a lot, Michael, because um, <laughs> we just published a paper on this. Um, uh, the, um, the models for how telomere length is regulated, all of the models that have been out there for the last 30 years indicate that the number of telomere binding proteins that are bound to those telomere repeats regulates the telomere length. And so everybody has um, assumed and all the measurements um, suggested that all the telomeres in the cell were in that same equilibrium um, because um, the, of the model that uh, suggests how it's regulated. But with new technology comes new knowledge. So we just recently um, used nanopore sequencing, which is a way to do very long DNA sequencing reads. Um, and by doing that, we could sequence both the telomere repeats and the subtelomere. So we could know what chromosome that telomere was on. And we discovered, just as you were indicating, that actually each chromosome has its own idea of what long and short is. So yes, there is a different distribution. Chromosome 1L has a different distribution of chromosome 2L, and actually there are non-overlapping distributions. It's quite striking, and we don't know the mechanism for this. So this is something that um, we're actively pursuing right now. Great, no, fascinating. No, I, and I haven't read the paper, but I'm going to right away. Yeah, <laughs> we just published it. <laughs> uh, okay, let me go to the uh, Q&A. There are a bunch of questions. So. Uh, uh, Nick Dervisis, who's uh, one of our veterinary oncologists here, asks, what is your opinion of telomerase-targeted anti-cancer approaches as far as affecting normal tissue telomere length? Yeah, so this is, this is why it's important for people to understand that there are two sides to the telomere coin. For a long time, when we knew that um, uh, telomerase was activated in cancer cells, there were a lot of ideas about finding telomerase inhibitors to treat cancer. Um, I showed you the mouse model where we did find that um, short telomeres can limit the growth of cancer cells, but we have to be um, very careful because we now also know that short telomeres lead to these other degenerate diseases. So I think that there is room for um, possible treatments on both sides. If you have very short telomeres, you would want to um, possibly treat some of these age-related degenerative diseases. Um, on the other hand, on the cancer side, you would want to stop those cells from dividing. But if you uh, shorten the telomeres too much, then you're gonna tip into the disease. So I think this is where individualized medicine will be critical. And we have now this um, assay where we can um, determine telomere length on an individual basis. So if you knew somebody had very long telomeres constitutionally, um, perhaps there would be um, a window where they could have some telomerase inhibition and it wouldn't, uh, craft the rest of their system. So I think that those kinds of things need to be thought out very carefully and not in a cavalier way that they had been previously thrown around that we should just inhibit telomeres and, um, and uh, you know, protect against all cancers. It's not gonna be that simple. But I do think that there's some room, although there aren't yet any um, examples of uh, telomerase inhibitors uh, that have uh, made it through clinical trials. Okay, great. Um, Carla Finkelstein, who I think you spoke to earlier is one of our cancer researchers asked, she said in, in your cartoon, the length of the telomere is similar at both ends of the chromosome. So how is the mechanism so precise? Are, are they different in certain diseases? Does it have a meaning, the fact that they are the same? 
Um, I didn't mean to imply, I think my cartoon did uh, suggest that they're the same, uh, but as I uh, was just uh, answering uh, the question that you asked, Michael, um, we now know that um, individual chromosomes are, have somewhat different telomere lengths, and there's not a correlation between the lengths on one end and the other end. But it's still very, um, uh, very mysterious. Uh, there's still a lot of questions about how that equilibrium is established. Telomerase is needed for the raw material to shift the equilibrium to longer. But it doesn't make them super long. It only makes them long within this distribution. And how that mechanism works is uh, fascinating. Okay, thanks. Uh, Reed Montague, one of our uh, neuroscientists said, he's wondering about different neuronal populations that generally don't divide. Is this a special case for the telomere story, a very stable length? Is it, might they differ across different types of neurons, for example? Um, yeah, so non-dividing um, uh, tissues aren't going to have this, uh, this telomere problem, um, although there could be um, some issues depending on um, the developmental aspect. So there are very, very severe uh, telomere patients. Um, uh, normally, this is uh, inherited, um, it's an, uh, haploinsufficient, so people with just one mutation in telomerase show these effects. But if you actually have a case where you have two mutations in telomerase, uh, you actually see cerebellar hypoplasia. Um, so there are some neuronal effects, but only in the very severe, and these individuals don't last past a year or so. Okay. Um, oh. In terms of other, other um, uh, neuronal uh, aspects, certainly those cells that aren't dividing aren't gonna have um, a problem um, once they're in the post-mitotic stage. Right. Okay, um, Daniela Samini, who I think you spoke to, uh, mm -hmm. or a cell biologist, uh, uh, she asks, wouldn't telomerase inhibition in cancer cells select for cells that use alternate mechanisms? Um, that's certainly a possibility. And uh, that's one of the reasons that we were working for a while on these um, alternate mechanisms, because um, yes, just like um, any kind of treatment, um, you would want to know what the escapes are um, and be able to treat uh, with, uh, multiple prongs, just like, like HIV with the triple, um, triple therapy where you can have three different kinds of um, inhibition. So yes, uh, understanding what's happening in those 10% of tumors that don't activate telomerase is important for treatment. Okay. Uh, Uliana Lazar, another one of our biology faculty asks, is there a difference in telomere length between fast and slow dividing cells? Um, we haven't seen that in either our yeast experiments or our human experiments. Um, it, it, the shortening rate has to do with the number of cell divisions, not the speed. Um, Anthony Lamontia, another one of our neurobiologists asks, um, if you disrupt apoptosis initiation and the telomerase null later generation mice, will they get tumors like their non-telomerase null, count, null counterparts? Um, yeah, we didn't do those experiments, but, but certainly um, what happens is uh, that the, the cells get short and the DNA damage response um, allows apoptosis to occur. But what we did do was to do this in a um, P53 heterozygous mouse because it's a P53 pathway that causes the apoptosis. Um, and uh, the P53 heterozygous mouse, when it's telomerase null, uh, the tumors will arise because they lose the other allele of P53. And so now you can't do the apoptosis, but you still have a chromosome catastrophe that occurred. So um, my prediction is that if you didn't, that's, that's a way of inhibiting um, apoptosis is to take out the T53 gene. Um, and they, they die by other mechanisms. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ji Shang, one of our uh, faculty members who works on uh, uh, brain tumor uh, biology and developing therapeutics says, telomere, sh <clears throat> telomere shortening could block cancer cell growth while also inducing senescence in normal immune cells and stem cells. How could telomere shortening be used as a cancer therapy without causing significant toxicity, particularly toxicity to the immune system? Right, so that's, that's why I said that if you're gonna um, think about ways to inhibit telomerase in cancer, you have to understand what the patient's uh, normal telomere length is because the immune just with short telomeres um, but if they were well above the 50th percentile, perhaps a short course of a telomerase inhibitor wouldn't take out the immune system. So th those are the kinds of ways you would have to navigate those questions. 
Okay. Um, Sharon Ramey, a uh, developmental uh, psychologist and neuroscientist, says most of the predictions about racial black versus white difference in telomere length were not correct. Even though uh, blacks generally have a much higher rates of many major age-related diseases, the largest studies that take into account socioeconomic status variables and stressors, cumulative life stress, the results are not consistent with predictions. How do you interpret these findings? Um, I think it's becoming very uh, clear from a lot of the biology that we're learning that race is a social construct. Um, we can't use it as a genetic um, underpinning because um, it's a social construct. And yes, there are major socioeconomic differences that contribute to racial disparities uh, in healthcare, um, but I don't think it has anything to do with the telomeres. Okay, and let me see, we just another couple minutes, take a couple last questions here. Uh, Anthony Lamonti asked another question. He said, uh, um, do some generations in the human pedigree eventually become sterile or less reproductively competent? That is certainly um, a prediction. And um, uh, we certainly looked at that for a while um, at Johns Hopkins. I think that there have been um, a few studies uh, that suggest that um, infertility is one of the um, uh, consequences, um, but uh, it's not a major effect uh, in the telomere families, and that may be because the um, uh, these other effects, the pulmonary fibrosis and the immune senescence, are so strong um, that those individuals with telomere short enough to show um, infertility um, might not make it to that age. Okay. Uh, let's see. Ramesh Patra asked, "Does chemotherapy affect telomere length?" Um, Telomere length affects chemotherapy. <laughs> uh, individuals that uh, have short telomeres are super sensitive to chemotherapy because we know that the short telomeres are causing um, a DNA damage response that's what causes the cell death. And there's very clear evidence that there's an additive effect. So if you take cells that have short telomeres and treat them with chemotherapy, they die much sooner than long telomeres because the short telomere cells already have a little bit of DNA damage and now you're adding more DNA damage onto them. So um, I think that's, that's the, the strongest correlation that I know there. Okay, all right, and we'll just do one last question here about at the end of time. Uh, Jessica Fleming asks, are there any toxins that contribute to telomerase dysfunction? For example, benzene causing MDS or uh, growing phosphate causing uh, uh, Parkinson's. Are there any chemicals in the environment you know of that might affect telomeres or telomere length? Um, I don't know of chemicals in the environment. There is um, some literature about um, oxidative stress and, um, and the ability of uh, telomere binding proteins to bind to, uh, to telomeres when there's oxidative damage to the, to the DNA. That's the only in extrinsic um, uh, pathway that I've uh, come across. Okay. Well, look, thank you very much. We've given you a lot of questions, uh, Carol, and a uh, great seminar, great answers to questions. Thanks so much for your talk. Thank you. And uh, I want to thank everybody for just participating and joining this evening. We'll see you uh, at the next uh, Distinguished Public Lecture. So thank you all. Have a great evening. And uh, Carol, I'll, I'll see you in a little while. Okay. Okay. Thanks, everybody.